Thank you so much for letting me be a part of this conversation. I'm going to occupy this space at the podium because I'm a writer and very much attached to my words. Um, but thank you so much. I'm honored to be a part of this conversation about the progress of girls and women. And when I first heard about the theme of this conference, as a narcissist that I am, I thought, how do I fit in into this conversation? Because from my own experience, when well-meaning people say that they're talking about or advocating for or fighting on behalf of the protection of girls and women, they're often talking about a very specific girl. And it's very rare that they're talking about a girl like me. I grew up um, in a low-income neighborhood called Kalihi on the island of Oahu in Honolulu, Hawaii. I um, grew up in the middle of five children with a mother who was a teen mother, um, two older sisters who were teen mothers, and a father addicted to crack cocaine. I struggled, and our family struggled, with our sense of homelessness and joblessness throughout my adolescence and childhood. And we struggled for resources in already um, communities that were ravaged by poverty. And if this wasn't enough, I also had my own identity issues, right? And I was welcomed into the world as my parents' firstborn son. I was named after my father. I was dressed in attire suited for boys. I, my gender was translated for me from the very beginning and expressed for me. And as a child, I struggled deeply and fought hard to not only be myself, but to reveal myself and express my femininity in a culture that demeans and devalues feminine people, in a culture that mandates that if you are born with certain genitals, you are not allowed to express who you truly are if that expression does not align with the gendered expectations thrust upon you and your body. And despite this pervasive gender policing culture, I own my difference as a young person and I marvel at my teenage self, that girl with the unwavering sense of self who never allowed anyone's expectations of her or perceptions of her make her question or doubt who she knew she was. And that self-assuredness was the key to my success. It enabled me to reveal myself, reveal my true self, to transition through the halls of my high school and I became the first person in my family to go to college, the first to leave our struggling neighborhood, to move to New York City, to attend graduate school at New York University, to earn my master's degree, and to work as an editor at People Magazine. And as I basked in my own success, I couldn't ignore the fact that my experience with success was completely outside the norm for girls growing up like I did. I couldn't ignore those girls because I know that they don't have the same resources that I had benefited from. And many of my sisters are grappling with homelessness, joblessness, a lack of access to healthcare and to education. And these, this sense of lack often pushes them out of hostile homes, out of intolerant schools that are not built for them, into detention homes and facilities, and also prisons, and deeper and further into poverty. And these interconnected issues also push them into underground economies like sex work, which is often the default method under which trans women make the money, earn the money to support themselves, to nurture themselves with food, clothing, medicine, and shelter, basic resources that we collectively do not provide for them. And this dangerous, stigmatized work makes them all the more or even more vulnerable to HIV. Trans women are among the most at-risk demographic, as well as the most likely to face medical discrimination. And trans women of color are even more likely to be profiled by police, to be incarcerated, and to be targets of abuse and violence. And these alarming issues often go uncharted and remain widely unaddressed because we, as a society, do not acknowledge that trans women are women, that black and brown bodies matter, that trans girls and women of color are worthy of protection and worthy of our care. And these were the urgent issues that pushed me to step forward for the first time in my life as a young trans woman and to use my voice to tell my story and to help tell our stories. And I've been successful. 
I've written a New York Times bestselling book. I've launched um, empowerment campaigns like hashtag redefining realness and um, hashtag read, um, girls like us. And I've been heralded even, which is ridiculous to me, as woman of the year. Um, and held up as the trans girl of color who's made it. And I'm proud to be that mirror for young girls. Um, a mirror that I frankly didn't have growing up. But we have to look beyond this mirror and look at the reality. And the reality is, is that the level of success that I have had is not accessible to girls growing up like I did. And when I say success, I'm not talking about the accolades. I'm talking about living freely and safely and being able to obtain shelter, healthcare, and means to support yourself. These things should not be out of reach for any girl. And we cannot celebrate success stories like mine without discussing how society made it impossible for me and how it continues to fail these trans girls and low-income low women of color. And these girls, they stand at the intersection of race, class, and gender on the margins of our society. And because women are not valued, because trans people are constantly invalidated, and because trans, um, and because people of color are exiled, trans women of color live at an intersection that I like to call pass her by and pay her no mind. We have our work cut out for us and creating the world we want for girls and women starts with our own, our own openness to embracing girls and women from all walks of life. We cannot only care about the ones who remind us of us or who look like our daughters or the ones the media consistently frames as worthy of our affection, attention, and care. And we have to care about all girls. And when I say these girls, I mean girls like Monica Jones, an activist in Phoenix, Arizona, who was wrongfully arrested because police said she looked like a sex worker. That's enough nowadays. If you're carrying condom as a trans woman of color on the streets of New York City, you can get profiled and arrested. It's real. Girls like Larry Letitia King, a gender nonconforming eighth grader who was murdered in class in 2008 because of their gender expression and their sexual orientation. Girls like Gwen Arajo, a 17-year-old who was beat and strangled to death by four men because she was a trans woman. Girls like Cece McDonald, who served 19 months in prison, in a men's prison, because she chose to stand her ground and she chose to fight for her life. As we know, only certain people can stand their ground and not go to jail. Girls like Elon Nettles, a 21-year-old who was beaten just blocks away from here, beaten to death in Harlem, just across the street from a police station. These girls and countless others have been beaten and jailed. They've been exiled and extinguished because they are girls and women, because they are girls and women of color, because they are girls and women of color who are trans. In the world I see and that I envision, these girls are nurtured and they're protected and they are liberated. They are included in conversations about violence against women, about HIV prevention and about reproductive rights. They have access to women's colleges and restrooms. They have access to unbiased knowledgeable and affordable health care. They no longer fall in between the gaps of feminist, racial justice, and LGBT movements. They are centered. And they are centered because they mattered and they are centered because our own liberation lies in their well-being and their survival. So the next time you hear someone say that we're having a conversation or that they're working for the progress of girls and women, I'd love for you to ask them whether they're talking about a girl like Elon Nettles, a girl like Cece McDonald, a girl like my sisters and my friends, a girl like me. Thank you.